and I've been looking and I think for looking for the person who's attended the most talks and clearly the winner is Vanya, but he's the organizer, so it doesn't count. So, but the best I can find other than that is 12 with Ernesto. So Ernesto, um, if anyone else has 12 or more talks that they have attended, um, switch on your video, uh, let me know by chat. If not, um, Ernesto, do you want to switch on your video for a second? And I'm going to switch mine off. Maybe Elizabeth, you switch off yours for a second. I'm going to take a picture of the organizer and, uh, and Ernesto, the survivors of this. Um, so congratulations to you. I think you're the winner, at least the winner who's here now. There may have been someone who saw 19 talks and left three hours ago, but for now, you I must warn you that this is my pandemic circle. <laughs> and then so to avoid the camera, but now it's, it's sure shooting. understood. And then, if as many people who'd like to would like to put their video on whilst I'm making this announcement, because I mean, Zag has I think 40, 41 organizers. Um, I've never seen anything like it, but really, there is one organizer who has been in charge not just of the Zag seminar but also this complete madness today, and that is Vanya. So, as people are switching on their video, maybe. Maybe we can have a round of applause and I'll take a picture of this. I'm um, just at least the people who are here. Um, but for everyone to say thank you for this event. Let's do that. I thank, you. Uh, thank you, Julius. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, you made me blush. <laughs> There's a button on Zoom you can press to fix that, okay? Um, okay, Elizabeth, that, that's my two announcements. Um, if you come back on and then you share your screen and I'll be ready to, ready to introduce you. And actually, if I, hold on a second. It did not work. second. Okay, so sorry, it was working before we did this. Let me reopen it. You take your time. Take your time. It's fine. Sorry, I think I was just, I think it's better if I go into full screen after. Ah, now I have control. Great. Okay. okay. Good. So I took a few minutes of you, so it's end at like 53, 54. So now let me introduce our final speaker of the marathon, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gross from Honolulu, who will be speaking on phylogenetic network varieties. Awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> what was that? I think you changed your title from what I had, but anyway. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Sorry, I didn't change the title. Um, well, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm happy to end this marathon in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, we in Hawaii like to, visit, to think about ourselves as the center of the world, right, because we're right there in the middle. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm happy to end this. And then I think we're, I'm also going to switch directions a bit and give you guys end with a applied talk and show, showcase how we can use algebraic geometry to answer prob problems in statistics. And so this is one particular um, application that really leverages the things that we know from basically um, the geometry and algebra statistical varieties. And so this is joint work with, um, with Travis Barton, Leo Van Ersel, Remy Janssen, Mark Jones, Colby Long, Yuka Hiro, Murakami and Joe Rosinko. And so there's a lot of authors here. It ba it's based on three main papers. And then I have Colby in blue because he belongs to each of those three main papers. So I think several years ago, me and Colby had gone to a phylogenetics conference and we we're like, all right, let's apply basically applied algebraic geometry to phylogenetic networks and see what we can say. And so this is sort of the story of the things that we've been able to stay, say. So what I want to do is I want to explain the application of phylogenetic inference. 
Um, I want to then explain the statistical property of identifiability and why is that important. Um, the role that algebraic geometry has in the statistical property of identifiability and how we can use these tools to say theoret uh, theoretical statistical things. Um, and then I want to um, end with a method for inference that really sort of combines computational algebraic geometry and statistical learning theory. So the main focus of my talk are going to be phylogenetic networks, but for me to introduce to you phylogenetic networks, I'm going to start with phylogenetic trees. And so this is the problem that we, we are faced with when we want to infer a phylogenetic tree. We're given some DNA sequences from a collection of species. So maybe I have three species and we want to figure out, okay, well, what is the tree the tree topology that's most likely to have given rise to this set of data. And so our data are the aligned DNA sequences and our problem is the topology. Um, and so this particular problem is interesting because it helps us understand biology more, um, but then it has other applications, for example, in conservation. So if we want to do restoration, there's been some evidence that if you use species that are more phylogenetically diverse, then um, you get hardier restorations. Um, another thing which is um, a little bit more um, yeah, timely with our, our current events is also in epidemiology. So actually this problem of inferring phylogenetic trees, we actually know how to do this quite fast now. And so if you have a pathogen, you can um, sort of you can sequence it in real time and you can um, do this phylogenetic tree in France and then that can give you ideas on how to make appropriate interventions. So there's a couple of ways to infer phylogenetic trees. Um, let's see. Uh, so one way is with distance-based methods, another is um, with maximum parsimony, and another class of methods are called model-based methods. And that's gonna be the realm that we're gonna be li living in. So let me explain what a tree-based Markov model is. So in a tree-based Markov model, you're gonna assume that evolution proceeds along an n-leaf tree. So n is gonna be my number of taxa that you can think about as species. Um, it is, uh, we have hidden variables in this model. So I assume that I can only observe the living species. So the leaves of these trees and any of the interior nodes are hidden from me. So they represent extinct species. Um, there's a couple of um, technical assumptions that you make in a tree-based Markov model. You uh, assume site independence. So what is a site? So here are my three aligned DNA sequences. And if I just go down and I look at one column here, that's called a site. And so if I look at, I'm sorry, I keep on doing this with my mouse. I might try that. And so if I go down this column, I have, so I have four nucleic bases, ACGT, and I have three species. So in each of these sites, I can see one of 64 sequences, right? One of um, 64 th three tuples. So here I see GAA. So our data, um, our data is going to look like as follows. So I'm going to count each time I see, for example, GAA or the number of times I see GGT. And then I'm going to take that count and I'm going to divide by my number of sites. And so when I do that, that gives me the frequencies of each of these three tuples in this aligned DNA se sequence. And those observed frequencies are an estimate of a probability di distribution on those three tuples, okay? And so our tree-based Markov model is actually giving us the distribution over n tuples where n is our number of taxa. And what we're thinking about as our data is this vector of observed frequencies. So let me get, now I'm gonna go one more level down into detail. And so let's say I'm gonna start with a very simple model, which is a three leaf tree. This is the three leaf claw tree. I have one hidden random variable and I have three observed random variables. Each of these random variables can take one of four possible states, ACGT. Um, and 
y is hidden, but it has some distribution pi, pi a, pi c, pi g, pi t. Okay. And then along each of the edges, I'm going to assign a transition matrix. And so if I look at the transition matrix as assigned to M1, the ith entry is going to tell me the probability that xi is equal to j given that y was in state i. And so once I've described this model to you, then we can actually write down the probabilities of observing any three tuple. And so, in fact, we can just go back to, um, you know, our probability that we took in as an undergrad, and we can write this out specifically. So if I want to say, what is the probability of observing A here, G here, and T here, well, what I have to do, since this is hidden and I don't have any information about it, I have to, con I have to compute what is called the marginal probability. So I have to go over all the possible states of Y and, and then sum up those probabilities. So I will start with, okay, well, what's the probability that Y is equal to A? Well, it's pi, uh, pi A. And then if I am observing A here, what's the probability that I stay in state A? Well, that's that eighth, eighth entry of M1. What's the probability that I go from A to G along here? Well, that's the eighth, chief entry of M2, et cetera. And so now I do this for, um, now I assume that Y, oops, now I assume that Y was equal to C, G, and T. And so what do we get here? We get a polynomial. So if I think about the entries of my transition matrices as indeterminates, then I get a polynomial in these indeterminates, uh, in the entries of my transition matrices. And so in fact, okay, so that's me sort of writing it all together. And so in fact, I can think about the parameterization of this model. So the model is gonna be all probability distributions that I get according to this tree. So that means that um, it's going to be the set of all probability distributions that I get no matter what I specify M1, M2, M3 as. So in algebraic statistics, we tend to think about models as collections of probability distributions, right? And so these are probability distributions on, in this case, on three tuples. And so I have 64, so it's a discrete state space with 64 possible outcomes and I can organize it as a four by four by four table, right? And so a probability table is just gonna be a four by four by four table and everything's going to sum by one. So I'm gonna look at the probability tables that I can get under this map, okay? And so this map is taking this pi, it's taking these entries of these matrix and it's getting mapped here. And so now I'm concerned about the image of this map and the image of this map is what we call the model. And so a classic, um, a classic thing that we do in algebraic statistics is that once we have a statistical model, we look at it's the risky closure. So instead of you know, working over the R's here, um, I can also work over the complexes um, and I get the variety associated to the model. So the, the way that you can think about that is I'm taking the image of this parameterization and then I'm taking the Zariski closure. And then once I have the variety, I also have the ideal associated to the model and those are going to be the set of all my polynomials that vanish um, for all of my tables in the model. And, and this is going to be a recurring object that will come back up later in the talk. So now this particular um, model is sort of interesting in the fact that so this is the general, the, what I described to you is called the general Markov model. And it is called the general Markov model because we're not putting any restrictions on these transition matrices. And so if I actually look at the image of this map, what I have here is a rank four tensor, right? Because I can think about each of these as um, rank one, uh, um, sorry, I can think about this as a rank one tensor and I'm summing up four of them. And so actually the variety associated to this model is, is well known. So it is, um, we can call it the set of all four by four by four tensors with border rank less than or equal to four. So the thing with rank with tensors is not closed. So if I look at matrices and I look at matrix, you know, all matrices with rank less than or equal to 
a N or something, right? That's an algebraic, um, so uh, that's a closed set. But the set of rank, rank less than or equal to N tensors is not necessarily closed, but I can close it. And so that's what that border rank operation is. Um, the other thing, and um, so another word for this uh, particular variety is also, and I have it written here, so we can think about it as um, the set of all four by four by four tensors with border rank less than or equal to four, or I can think about it as the fourth sequent variety of the segregate product P3 cross P3 cross P3. And so this is really where the connection between like statistics and algebraic geometry are coming into play. So people are studying these models, they're taking the, the closures and they're saying, oh, you know what, this looks like a classical object in algebraic geometry. Let's see if we can make con connections. And so this particular variety, this model variety for this four state general Markov model on this claw tree. Um, so actually Elizabeth Allman, um, I think in like maybe, uh, I, I forget when, maybe 2008 or something, um, presented uh, the problem of what are the polynomials that cut out this particular variety. And so, um, my advisor at UIC, Shmuel Friedland, had written a paper and he had shown that it was cut out by polynomials of degree five, degree 16, and degree nine. And so the conjecture that she had put forward was degree five, degree six, and degree nine. Um, and so we were able to take that one step further and replace that as degree 16 polynomials with degree six. And so this actual, um, problem that was called the salmon conjecture. And it was called the salmon conjecture because Elizabeth Allman lives in Alaska. And so what she had said was, okay, well, if anyone solves this problem, I'll go out into my backyard, I'll catch a salmon, I'll smoke it, and I'll send it to you. So actually, Franklin had gotten half of a salmon for his first paper, because if we notice here, this is a set theoretic description of this variety. And her original conjecture was really about the ideal theoretic uh, description of this variety. And so that part of that problem is still open. And so if you're interested in a half a salmon, that's something that you guys can look at. Okay, so why was she interested in these polynomials? So we're interested in these polynomials because we can use them to select trees. So there's algebraic methods for selecting trees. And so this uses the ideal of phylogenetic invariance. Unfortunately, um, this is poorly worded, but we, we carry it forward. So we think about the, I, the elements of the ideal associated to the model, we call them phylogenetic invariance, and we can use them to infer a tree topology. And the idea is, because if I have a polynomial that's in this ideal, then if I'm actually taking perfect data, so a perfect probability distribution, then that polynomial should evaluate to zero for that probability distribution, right? And let's say my probability distribution is no longer perfect, it has some noise, right? Because I got it this the way that I described at the beginning of my talk by aligning DNA sequences and taking frequencies. Now that's no longer a perfect distribution. It'll be perfect in the long run, right? If my sequences go on and on and on forever, but in reality, it has some noise. So those polynomials are not going to evaluate to, to exactly to zero anymore, but they're going to be pretty close to zero. And so this is the fundamental idea. So we're going to say, hey, I'm going to take one of those polynomials, okay? And if it evaluates close to zero, I'm gonna say this data came from this tree. So this only works because the varieties are distinguishable in the sense that if I take any, any two unrooted trees, so the root is actually not distinguishable. So all I'm doing is I'm taking my tree and I'm, I'm losing information about direction each of the model varieties corresponding to each of those unrooted trees are different, okay? And, sorry. So they're different, and in fact, when they intersect, they only intersect on um, a set of smaller dimension. And so that's what we mean by distinguishable. And that, this um, definition is, will come into play a little bit later, and so we'll revisit it. 
Um, and so we can actually use these algebraic methods. And so they were first proposed by Cavendish and Felsenstein in 1987 and independently by Lake. So Cavendish and Felsenstein and Lake, they both only use linear invariance. So you look at the ideal and there's a couple of linear equations and they use those to actually select trees. And so more recently, Marta Casanellas and Jesus Fernandez Sanchez actually used the full set of invariants. So they took a generating set of the ideal and saw if they and explored whether they got more power in this tree selection problem than they did. And so this is where the idea of algebraic methods for selecting trees and they and these methods have gotten um, better over the year over the years. All right. So there's one more sort of technicality I want to go over because I explained to you the um, general Markov model. And in fact, what I'm going to be working with is what's called a group based Markov model. So the general Markov model is almost um, too general, right? Because I can allow these entries, as long as I have a stochastic matrix here, um, I'm fine. So there's no, um, there's no restrictions on the entries of these matrices. But that means that um, I have a lot of parameters, so parameter estimation is going to be hard. And so it's better to work where I have less parameters. And so one way to do that is with a group-based Markov model. And so what you're going to do is, instead of allowing um, a sort of freedom in these parameters for each of the transition matrix, matrices, you're going to force each of the transition matrices to have a particular form. So, the, so um, I'm sort of using this as shorthand. I don't mean that all of M1, M2, M3 have exactly this matrix. They'll each have, M1 will have like an alpha one that will go along the diagonal, a beta one, a gamma one, a delta one, etc. And then M2 will have like an alpha two, a beta two, a gamma two, a delta two. So they each have this structure. And so actually we've reduced 16 parameters for each of these transition matrices now down to four. And so most people will tend to work with these group-based Markov models rather than the general Markov model. And in a group-based Markov model, we tend to view the elements of a group. So in this case, this is the Kimura 3 um, Markov model that has, sorry, that has this form. And then we view the elements um, ACGT as elements of the group C2 cross C2. And so these are the transition matrices for each of the commonly used group-based models. So you have a two-state model. This is really um, where we do a lot of, uh, you can get a lot of dimension reduction from this. But in the models that we're going to be talking about um, in this talk, they're going to be Jukes Cantor, uh, Kimura 2 parameter, and Kimura 3 parameter. Okay, and so Jukes Cantor may be the most widely used. So I have one parameter that tells me, hey, the probability of staying the same um, is is one value and the probability of changing is another value. All right, so these are our three. All right, so one, um, one of the nice things about group-based phylogenetic models is the following. So if I can do the same process that I did before, right, where I went through and I wrote down the probability of observing like A, C, G or something, right? And when I do that, I'm going to get um, these crazy polynomials. Um, so just like in the general Markov model, like um, these polynomials end up being quite hard to work with. And so what's nice about group-based models is that there's a certain transform that we can do. So there's this um, Bray transform where a group-based model then becomes parameterized by monomial functions in terms of new parameters that we call Fourier parameters. So how does this work? And so now this is a nice way that we now bring in sort of combinatorics and um, combinatorial commutative algebra into the problem. Okay, and so if you want to learn more about this, there's a nice paper by Sternfels of Sullivan that really gets into these toric phylogenetic ideals. And so 
the parameterization is as follows. So if I have any tree, I can get a partition of the leaves by removing an edge, right? So each edge induces a partition. For example, if I remove this middle edge right here, it um, induces a partition of my leaves where I have one, two, one, two in one part and three, four in the other part. And I'm, I'm sorry, that's my mouse that keeps on doing that. Okay. And so this parameterization is monomial and I'm going to get a, so this is my probability of observing A, C, G, T on the leaves one, two, three, four. And actually it's not the probability anymore because I'm in Fourier coordinates and so I lose that sort of sense of probability. But in Fourier coordinates, my A, A C, G, T is going to be the following, is going to be parameterized as follows. So it's going to be a monomial, and I'm going to have a term that corresponds to each of the splits of my tree. So for this four leaf tree, I have each of the trivial splits that corresponds to just removing each of the edges adjacent to a leaf, and then the split that I get from removing the middle edge. And so these I are indexed above by the splits. Now the index below is given by um, me thinking about each of these um, A, C, G, T as elements of C2 cross C2. And what's going to happen is I'm going to add up everything on each of the sides of the splits. So if I think about this labeled as A, C, G, T, then when I remove this, I get A here and C here. And when I add those together as group elements, I get C back. And so that gives me the index of C here. For the trivial splits, I just get the initial labeling, right? Because my, if I remove this, I just get this back and then I get these three. And so that is the, um, the monomial parameterization that we get. And so it is of this following form. And what's going to happen is I, I get coordinates for whenever these A, C, G, T, if I think about them as elements of C2 cross C2, they need to add up to the identity. And if they don't I add up to the identity, then it goes to zero. All right, so this is our new parameterization. And so now what it does is saying, hey, I have these group-based phylogenetic models. I can think about them in probability space, or I can transform everything and I can think about them in Fourier space and Fourier coordinates. And when I do that, I get toric varieties. And so that's very nice. I get to apply everything um, about toric varieties there. So now what I did was I gave you sort of the fundamentals for phylogenetic trees. And now I want to take it one step um, to phylogenetic networks. And so phylogenetic networks, so it's very nice to think about um, evolution in terms of these trees, but what we see biologically is maybe um, a tree isn't necessarily always the um, best object to use. So you can have events like hybridization. So for example, um, there's a professor here at UH Manoa that looks at lizards that have a lot of hybridization, right? And if I have a lot of hybridization like that, I'm not going to have my evolutionary history is not going to be a tree anymore. It's going to be more of a network. It means that I'm going to allow edges to go back and forth. Um, another phenomenon that I can have is horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer. And so this is an example of um, a clade of fungi or mushrooms, and you have some horizontal gene transfer going on. And I, I believe that this is assumed that happens because the cell, cell walls tend to be sort of small, and so you can have some exchange of genetic material. All right, so if we know that biological processes are not always, in terms of these trees, that they could be networks, we need to have processes to um, infer such networks. So let's look at um, phylogenetic networks. So a phylogenetic network is really when um, it starts off being a combinatorial object. Um, and so we're going to put some restrictions on the combinatorics of a phylogenetic network. Um, I'm going to have uh, the root has to have out degree two. So I'm not just going to allow any sort of graph. Um, any a vertex with out degree zero, so a leaf, has in degree one. So I can't. Um, 
I can't go, I can't reticulate into a leaf. Um, and then the set of all of our vertices without degree zero is n, which is our number of leaves. Um, and then all other vertices either have in degree one and out degree two, so that would be that one, or they have in degree two and out degree one. And so these vertices right here, so the one I'm pointing to right here is sort of special, and we're going to call this a reticulation vertex. So if it has in degree two, we call it a reticulation vertex, and I'm, we're going to call the edges that lead into it reticulation edges. And in fact, where we, um, when we represent these, all of the other edges we're going to represent with uh, just straight, um, you know, regular lines, but we're going to represent the reticulation edges with dotted lines because they have sort of a special um, designation. So now let's look at phylogenetic networks. So what we're going to do, so a phylogenetic network model is a mixed, so it can be obtained by mixing distributions. And I, I want to have a side here that is actually um, in algebraic statistics, we also talk about mixture models. So if I have two trees, I can have um, a mixture model of those two trees. And then geometrically, that corresponds to the secant variety. So, um, so mixtures of phylogenetic trees, since phylogenetic trees correspond to torque varieties, when I take their mixtures, I, can't, I get secant varieties, um, torque varieties. This is going to be a little bit different in the fact that when I have that, um, I allow different, in my parameterization, these are different sets of parameters. And in a network model, I get I identification. So instead of having um, a secant variety, this is going to be a sub-variety of a secant variety. Okay, and so how do I get a phylogenetic network model? Well, I take, here is my phylogenetic network. It has two reticulation edges. And so basically I can think about things evolving on two trees. One tree that has this edge over here and the other tree that has this edge. And so, but the difference between in a mixture model, I might give like M1 and the M1 over here and the M1 over here could be different but in a network model, they have the same parameters, okay? Because the length is gonna be the same. And so I have this identification of parameters, and so my parameterization looks something of the following form, where I have some delta, and then I have my parameterization for tree one, and then one minus delta and my parameterization for tree two. And when I, I'm gonna look at this map, and the same thing that we do in algebraic statistics, right? I have this image of the map, it lives in the reals, but I want to take the Zariski closure of it and I get what is called the network variety. All right, and so I tend to um, usually include this slide um, for people that are more interested in the algebra aspects of it, right? Because we've gone from a monomial parameterization to a binomial parameter parameterization. Um, one thing that's open is sort of the, what are the implicit equations for these network models. And so if you wanted to know what the implicit equations were, you really have to understand these relationships. And these can also be fun things to play with because there's a lot of underlying combinatorics that are going on here. All right, so we're interested, so the first thing, if I wanna do meaningful statistical inference with phylogenetic networks, the first thing that I need to do is establish that the network parameter is itself identifiable. I'm gonna define identifiability in terms of, of varieties for this talk. So I'm going to say that two networks are distinguishable if their corresponding varieties only intersect on a lower dim dimensional set. So this will be identifiable, this will not be identifiable. And if I'm looking at a class of networks, um, if all pairs of the networks are distinguishable, then we're gonna call that network parameter generically identifiable. All right, so one thing that goes on here with networks that we're sort of inheriting from trees is for trees are root node is not 
identifiable, right? So the best I can do is identify up to the undirected topology or the unrooted topology. And so networks, we get the same thing, except in this case, the be our best hope are what are called semi-directed network topologies. So how do I get the semi-directed network topology? Well, I look at this graph, I unroot it, okay? And so if I look at unrooting it, this is what I get. And then I'm going to, um, after I unroot it, I don't care about the directions on the non-reticulation edges anymore, but I do care about the directions on the reticulation edges. And so that's what our semi-directed network is gonna be. So in fact, if I look at this phylogenetic network and this phylogenetic network, um, their network varieties are exactly the same, right? And so I cannot tell them apart. So let's start our exploration by looking at small cycle networks. Okay, so I'm going to call um, if it has like um, a three cycle or a four cycle, um, a small cycle network. And I'm just going to check my time here. Okay, so if I look at the first thing that uh, Colby Long and I explored were Jukes Cantor cycle networks. So I'm assuming a Jukes Cantor group based model. And so I have um, a couple of different possible topologies. I have the trees, I have what is called a three cycle here, and I have a four cycle. And so we actually sort of went through and classified each of these. And so for the four leaf Jukes Cantor cycle networks, there are three uh, distinct six dimensional varieties, which correspond to trees, <clears throat> our three trees. We have six seven dimensional varieties corresponding to the three cycle networks, and we have 12 eight dimensional varieties corresponding to the four cycle networks. Okay, so I'm going to actually post this post that right now so we can see what's going on here. So we expect only three with trees because we only have three unrooted, um, sorry, we only have three unrooted topologies. Um, and then we have our three cycles. And so, in fact, I have some identification of the, of the three cycles, but I have a representative of each of the varieties that we get. And then for 12, so I would have like 20, you know, for a four leaf network, I have 24 possible labelings, but I have, I have some uh, symmetry here. Okay, and so I get my 12 possible varieties. All right, so those are all of our network varieties that we have. Um, one thing to note here, um, which is sort of like a bad news for phylogenetic inference, is that for the three cycle networks, I actually cannot tell the, um, which ones are the reticulation um, edges. So for a three cycle network, I can tell like, okay, who's on which side of the triangle, right? Like who's on uh, this sort of cherry and who's over on this side. But I actually can't tell the direction. So all of those varieties end up being the same. And so that's, that's sort of bad news on the phylogenetic side because those are the types of relationships that we, we would really like to understand. But we have, I mean, in, we have no hope of doing it with this me method because the varieties are the same. So what about, um, what is the good news? Well, for large cycle networks, um, so if I look at a large cycle network, so this is a phylogenetic network with a single reticulation vertex. So if I have a single reticulation vertex, I have a single cycle. And so we know that the semi-directed network topology of large cycle Jukes Cantor networks is generically identifiable. And so we're able to do this by um, distinguishing a repair of n leaf large cycle networks. And we do that actually by restriction um, and then distinguishing the restrictions. And so it ends up being um, a combinatorial and algebraic proof, maybe some of the, um, there's just a couple of cases that we need to um, look at. So for example, if I look at these two phylogenetic, um, phylogenetic networks, they're um, large cycle, then I restrict to this set. This is the restriction that I get here. And this is the restriction that I get here. These are going to correspond to two different network varieties and I can distinguish them with this polynomial. 
So um, Mean Colby ha handled the large cycle network case for Jukes scanner model, but what about Camera 2, uh, the Camera 2 parameter model and the Camera 3 parameter model? Well, recently Ben Hollering and Seth Sullivan, they were able to use algebraic matroids to extend this re result. And so, in fact, the semi-directed network topology of large cycle K2P and K3P network models are also generically identifiable. So it sort of started this conversation so that they were able to extend it for large cycle networks. So we are still only in the case of a single cycle though. And so now what about um, going a little bit further? So the next thing to look at that's sort of natural in this phylogenetic network world are what are called level one networks. And so a level one network is a network where a reticulation vertex can only belong to a single cycle. And so I have basically, if I look at my graph, I have no cycles that meet. They're, they're always sort of disjoint. And so if I look at my possible level one networks on four leaves, I have, a, I have four different possible topologies. I have this tree, I have this three cycle, I have a double three cycle, and I have a four cycle. So those are all of my four leaf level one, um, four leaf networks. And so taking this a little bit further, um, uh, with a group in the Netherlands, we were able to show that the semi-directed network topology parameter of triangle free level one Jukes Cantor Camara two parameter and Cathrea Camara three parameter network models is generically identifiable. So this is actually really big. So where me and Colby had started just looking at a first case, this is now taking it to all level one networks. Um, and, and honestly, level one networks are um, probably where you uh, are, where you're going to have the most value. Um, we can extend this. So like a next, you know, the next question, if you want to keep on going, there are networks called tree child networks or level two networks or level three networks. Um, and you can keep on going. But um, I think just getting it handled for level one networks was, was a pretty big deal. And so there we had a lot, um, there's a lot of combinatorial work underlying this proof. And so, um, oops. And so um, the group from the Netherlands had really done a lot of the nitty gritty work on, they're all like sort of combinatorial wizards and work this all out. Okay, so now what I wanna do by spending the last few minutes is, okay, so now that we know that we can, that the network topology is identifiable. Um, how can we use phylogenetic ideals and phylogenetic varieties to infer um, phylogenetic networks? So we're gonna start by trying to infer coordinates. So we have um, a little bit of a problem though, if I want to focus on coordinates. So this was the post set that I showed before, but now I've added um, these, uh, double three cycle networks. And they have the same dimension like as varieties, they have the same dimension as these uh, four cycle networks. So you can think about them living up on this level. Um, but here's the thing, these are all sort of small cycle networks and so they're not distinguishable, right? So the tree varieties sit within the three cycle varieties which sit inside the four cycle varieties. So I have like this nested variety problem. Um, and so I'm gonna not get that nice separation. And so what we did though is we do know that like this is a lower dimensional set for trees sitting within a higher dimensional set. And so there should be some polynomials that cut out this tree variety that are different than these three, three cycle varieties. And so we're gonna focus on sort of those. And so those are called our distinguishing invariants. And they should evaluate close to zero. So it's then trying to decide, okay, well, what is close to zero for our purposes? Um, now, if I were going to do like um, a rigorous statistical analysis, I would want to understand how, you know, the error is propagating through these polynomials, but they're, they're polynomials, right? And so, um, like, depending on the degree, they are, um, 
I don't think we really have any hope of understanding it in that sense. And so we, we turned then to statistical learning theory um, to help us try to figure out what close to zero could mean for us. And so we use support vector machines for this. And so a support vector machine, it basically aims, I have a bunch of uh, data points. And so you can think about this as my data points for <clears throat> a three cycle network and my data points for a tree. And I want to try to find a hyperplane that separates them. Now our data points are not gonna be um, the data that I had talked at the beginning. Those were my in my estimates of the probability distribution. I'm going, to trans I'm going to transform those into Fourier coordinates, and then I'm going to plug them into the invariance. So these are sort of the residuals on the invariance. And so if they're separated, if they're actually separated, then a support vector machine is going to try to find a separating hyperplane with the maximum margin. And this is just going to be um, some sort of optimization and then you can have a cost parameter that says it doesn't have to be a hard margin like this and most of reality it won't i might have some blue dots over here and i might have some orange dots over here i just add like a cost parameter that says okay how much do i want how costly do i want those misclassifications to be and so as a proof of concept here um my yellow dots here are going to be the residuals on a three cycle and my black dots are going to be the residuals on a um, on a tree and so i'm going to first start by and the, uh, these were very nice illustrations that colby long had created so here we're comparing a tree and a three cycle and i want to use two phylogenetic invariants that vanish on both so it belongs to the three cycle ideal and the tree ideal and we see that, okay, I don't get any separation. But if I actually use a distinguishing phylogenetic invariant, so something that vanishes on the tree, but not on the th three cycle, then I actually, um, a support vector machine can actually learn how to distinguish between the two. And so I do get some nice separation. And so our classification algorithm goes as follows. So you're going to take your aligned DNA sequences of four taxa. Um, as I said on the previous slide, you're going to compute the estimated Fourier coordinates. Um, you're going to evaluate. So what we did here, there's some choices to be made. But I have all of these ideals, right? Like I have my 12 ideals corresponding to the 12 four cycles, my six corresponding to the um, six three cycles, three to my three trees, and three to my three double three cycles. And what we did was we took generating sets. We, um, there's a certain process that you have to do to like symmetrize them because I, um, otherwise I, I can get weird results. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, and actually this, uh, this number has not been updated. After we symmetrize, we actually have 1100, around 1100 polynomials. And so we're, um, we're plugging in these estimated Fourier coordinates into these 1100 polynomials. They give me a vector, and then we train a support vector machine um, to choose among the coordinates. And so this is sort of an older, um, a older graphic before we had made some updates, but it still gives you an idea of where our trouble spots are. And so that's more of what I want to use. So we get around, right now we're getting around 85% accuracy. So if I look at this um, confusion matrix, on the bottom is the truth. So I have 24 different topologies. So the first three here, one, two, three are my trees, four to, um, four to nine are my three cycles, 10 to 21 are my four cycles, and 22, 23, 24 are my double three cycles. And so this is the truth and this is what's predicted. I want all of my mass to be along the diagonal here. And that means that I'm doing a pretty good job predicting. Um, and a lot, and so we get around 85% accuracy. So about 85% is on the diagonal. We do have um, some trouble. And so if we see these squares, so what do these squares correspond to? So these are with the four cycles. What happens is each four cycle has two embedded trees 
And um, for every choice of two trees, there's a collection of um, four, four cycles that have those two trees. And so you're seeing some misclassification, but, um, but this is almost like misclassification that we like because we can explain it. And so you, have, um, you see the same thing down here with the three cycles. Um, this has to do with um, every three cycle is sort of a mixture of two trees of the same topology. Um, each of the uh, three cycles has a, corresponds to a single tree, but then there's two three cycles that have the same tree and that's where you're seeing the mix up here. And so um, this uh, this sort of direction has been very promising. Um, and then the idea is, hey, after you can um, estimate the court nets, these four, four leaf um, networks, then you want to use some sort of al algorithm to build up into a giant, giant phylogenetic network. And actually Joe Rusinko has done some work with some students on doing that building up process. And so I'll just end here with a couple of future directions. So one um, conjecture that appeared in that original paper with Colby was one thing that we net, we saw that if N1 and N2 are two N leaf large cycle networks, then, the, then their dimension is equal. Um, so we have a little bit more to be said, said about that, but I'll leave that there for right now. Um, and so maybe I would say these are the two more interesting questions. So we have let n be an n leaf sunlit graph. Can one give a degree bound on the generators of i n? So for people that like algebra, um, this one's a really fun one. Um, I don't think anyone's made any progress on that. And then how do you ex extend this past level one networks? Can you go to level two networks, um, level three networks, et cetera? Can you go all to the tree child networks? And I'm going to end right there. And thank you guys. And here are a couple of the references in both cases are the identifiability references. And if you want to learn more about the toric ideals of these of of phylogenetic trees, this is a good reference, and then algebraic statistics in general. All right, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone in the audience have any questions? I mean, I was gonna ask, so you were using real data then in the example you were giving? So in the example that we're giving, we're actually using simulated data, so I can simulate on this. Um, we do have some real data that we want to use. So one of um, Joe Rusinko's collaborators has milkweed data, but that's going to be our last sort of thing. So we want to have our algorithm um, <laughs> all the way set and then um, make sure that uh, and then run it on the real data and then have the biologist then tell us, oh yeah, that's what I sort of expect. Because expect. she sort of has an idea of where the reticulation should be occurring. Um, and so we want to check against that. I was wondering if maybe you had, if one could have data where you knew for sure for some reason. I mean, even... Um, I think you, where you know for sure, I mean, like if you simulate it, you know for sure. And so that's how we're doing it. Um, there are like a couple of data sets where I think people are feel pretty comp like confident. There's like a rattlesnake data set where I think people like the um, there's like a lot of hybridization. I think with like lizards and snakes, like they're very there's a short sort of time and a lot of hybridization, and so they have a little bit more knowledge um, on what um, on what those trees should look like, and they are they're a little bit more certain of the hybridization. Um, I think it's more like that. Yeah. Very nice. Anyone else? No? It's two in the morning, I think, in the UK, right? Ah. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth, again. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank, thank the organizers. You. Yeah. And Esther, yeah? And let me, uh, on behalf of uh, me, uh, say thanks all the hosts. So. <laughs>
frankly it was a very big help and uh, every everyone helped a lot and everything went smoothly thank you thank